All right, Jeff, we're about three and a half days into the baseball regular season, and you and I have been around long enough to know uh, not to overreact. You know, you mm-hmm. Darvish has a fantastic start right, against the Astros. Um, you know, there's been some other really big starts. Um, Kershaw had a dominant start. You know, some guys haven't done that well. Cole Hamels, David Price. And, you know, it's tempting to feel good about the guys who did well and feel badly about the guys who did poorly. But the question I have for you, is there anybody in this three and a half days whose stock has either risen sh- dramatically or fallen sharply uh, from before the season started? And two, what does it take generally for you to start uh, you know, paying attention to what a guy's done in a small sample? What, what would he have to do in three days for it to really change your mind? I think I'm going to follow the Scott Pianowski construction is take a chance on the guy that's had an unusually good performance. Don't blow, give up on the guys that are established players that have had a bad performance. And I know that seems way simplistic, but every team, almost every league you're in, you have a bottom few spots, right? Especially in a mixed league format. You know, why not take a chance on the guy with the standout uh, performance like you did last year with R.A. Dickey? Why not take that and say maybe it is for real and you actually held on to him too? Uh, why not take a chance on that being for real? As, you know, you, if you don't, you miss out on Jose Bautista. You miss out on um, you know, Fernando Rodney. You miss out on Ben Zobris the year he breaks out. Take that chance. I mean, that, that's what those bottom spots of your roster are for. Uh, you, know, you don't give up on CC Sabathia because of one bad start. But you might give up on, you know, Joe, you know, your regular Joe, twenty third spot on your roster guy. That's the guy you give up on. Yeah, just uh, about R.A. Dickey. I picked him up about June, uh, and I picked him up because he had a start against the Padres and Pirates that week. Right. And he was so good in those starts that I couldn't drop him. But I did bench him against the Cardinals the following week, and he was just as good against the Cardinals. And then I realized maybe something's going on here. Mm-hmm. And I was I, I kind of lucked into him based on a streaming thing that just never stopped. Um, my rule, though, for three days or one day or one game or one at bat is it's sample size times magnitude. Okay, so the sample size say is one out of 162. You know, it's like one you know it's one game out of a season, but the magnitude could be huge. Like for instance, if a pitcher struck out 20 batters in a game, <laughs> you know, it's you can't do that. That's a huge magnitude. You if if Matt Harvey struck out 20, it would maybe open your eyes, right? Um, if Juan Pierre hit two 500-foot home runs in a game, uh, you know, then you'd think, okay, the government would have to get involved and investigate what was going on there, obviously, if that happened. But the point is, you know, the magnitude of something can, you know, it's basically, you know, we, we talk about the coin flip. If you flip four, four heads in a row, yeah, you got all heads, you got a perfect score, but, it, you know, the sample is small. If you flip 20 times in a row and you get all heads, it's still a pretty small sample, 20 flips, but all heads, the magnitude is so great, that's one in a million, that you have to start thinking there's something going on with the coin. And, and I think it's similar in baseball. I think, you know, if a guy has an above average start, okay, great. Uh, if a guy has a great start, okay, that's something. How high does the magnitude have to be? Now, when you Darvish is basically has a perfect game with 14 strikeouts, I know it's against a AAA club, um, you know, does that move the needle? Does that make you say, okay, I, you know, I know it's a bad team, but – to pitch that well, um, you know, maybe he should have been a top four starter. Right. And I had him a top eight. I had eight. I had him eighth overall anyhow. So for me, it's not much of a magnitude changer. I think that, that where it you know, does alter things is, hey, I got a stream against the Astros. I really, I mean, we knew the Astros were going to be bad, right? This is not any huge surprise. The, the, the real thing here is that we have to act a lot quicker. We have to be able to take a bigger chance on some of the guys you're streaming with. Bartolo Colon and, and Yahoo Friends and Family, come on down. I'm going to take that chance. I know he's coming off of suspension, blah, 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 and he's not a big strikeout pitcher. But come, when Matt Harrison gets nine Ks and five and two-thirds against this team despite getting a loss, yeah, i got to go after this. Yeah, that's going to be a common thing. I think it'll change, though. You know, we, I, we've seen this before. I can't remember what team it was, but about four or five years ago, there was a team. It might have been the Astros, but I don't think it was. It was just abysmal to open, and everyone said, oh, Get your starters in against them. But by midseason, they were, you know, just at your garden variety, average to below average offense. And, right. and you know, and I think that could easily happen. But, you know, you may as well get in early April when it's cold out and, and the getting is still good. Uh, what about some starters that I think are, are really the guys that, you know, were already kind of worrisome heading in. And, and mm-hmm. maybe the one start uh, says more uh, about them than, than some of the other pitchers that are just kind of, healthy and, and, you know, didn't have a bad year last year. Let's start with Roy Halladay. Right, um, the obvious one. Right, he's the obvious one. 
He started off last year with decent peripherals, but not great results, certainly below his normal average, uh, and, and the peripherals weren't as good as he, as, you know, he usually has elite peripherals. Uh, and then he got hurt. Um, comes back this year and ostensibly healthy, no pain in the spring. It was found out that he was actually hurt last year, but didn't say anything during spring when his velocity was down. Uh, during the spring, his velocity was way down this year, even below what it was last year. And it was down a little bit in his first start, which was a bizarre start where he strike, strikes out nine and three and a third, the most batters ever struck out in such a short start, uh, but also gave up two home runs and a bunch of hits and three walks. Um, what's your feeling on Halliday? Um, if he was a $20 pitcher, if he was a $27 pitcher heading into the last year, a $20 pitcher before spring training, a $15 pitcher is what he went for at NL Tout when his velocity, diminished velocity was known. What is he now? Seven, nine, maybe. I'm not going double digits on him because, hey, I mean, I, I know his track record, but we also know he has not pitched effectively since he's had diminished velocity. He has not been the same pitcher, period. And maybe, yeah, he got the strikeouts, but at the same time, I'm, I'm definitely very concerned about him. I will say one thing in his defense. You look at his last six starts against the Braves, they in particular have hit him hard, and they just got better this offseason offensively too. Maybe he's a spot starter now. Maybe that's the type of guy where you're not starting him week in, week out. You're, you're picking your spots with him. In the National League, that's possible. You still have the Pirates, the Cubs, the Padres, the Astros. Uh, not the Astros, sorry. Guys, so I'm going to say that like how many times this year? The Marlins, though. Even the Mets, it's debatable whether that's a pretty streamable uh, uh, opponent, too. Point being is you can get away with it a little bit more in the National League. There's going to be my chances where I'm going to still use Roy Halladay, but man. You don't want him going against the Nats, the, the Braves, the Reds, the Cardinals, the Diamondbacks. Those are offenses that I'm afraid of with him. Right. You could even do the Rockies on the road. Um, yeah, well, of course. Another, yeah. <clears throat> another team you can stream against. The, uh, the, I read some interesting stuff, and I wish I had noted the name of this blogger because he deserves credit for this. He did a study last year of Halliday's opening day start and what his velo last three years of his opening day start velocity and the velocity for the rest of the season. And pretty much the velocity in the opening day start for all of his pitches, his curve, his uh, cutter, uh, and his, uh, his changeup, tracked the velocity that he had for the rest of the year. And then he showed the velocity readings this year, and you and I had some sort of dispute about it, a little bit of a dispute about it, what it was uh, during the show today on the XM show. But this guy had it pretty low, you know, 89-90 for the fastball uh -huh. uh, and slower for the other pitches, obviously. And so if his pattern holds true, in other words, if the opening day velocity portends the velocity for the rest of the year, he's in right. big trouble because he's, right. he's throwing not as hard as last year. Now, okay, so, so that sounds bad, but Halliday also, you know, is a very smart guy, really knows what he's doing out there. Um, you know, last year he was actually hurt. He had an injury. This year he's not hurt. He's not in mm -hmm. pain. So I think there's a chance that he adapts and does some stuff differently, um, but – you might not want to be around for the ride as he's adapting right. and learning to pitch with diminished velocity. It's not something that is always a smooth transition, and maybe he gets there eventually where he's like <laughs> Johan Santana the last few years before he got hurt, where it's like passable but not the same as it once was. Right, yeah, but guess what? I've got him in labor. I can't bench him. <laughs> right. I'm, either, I, I'm either writing it out, trading him for 35 cents on the dollar probably because nobody yeah. in that league is going to pay up for him. Right. Nobody is. Uh, or... I cut him. I mean, it's it's one. Those are my options. I mean, it's almost like you hope he goes on the DL to regain, to work on his delivery, regain his velocity. They come up with something that's it's always going to be out three weeks, but they'll be back then. Then fine, I can bench him, watch him, and then I can I get that little buffer when he comes back, even for a week or two before I activate him. That's my out. That's really my hope right now, and it's it's not a good place to be. Well, that's a unique league, right? Where you can't yeah. bench a guy, so that's that's only unique to you, basically. Everybody else can bench him. Or they, anybody but, playing by the book, the old school rotisserie style, and plenty of people still do that. Especially people that subscribe to our site because they're probably in more intense leagues than they are. Than instead of one that's just you know joined on Yahoo or ESPN or you know Fox or anything like that. These are long-standing leagues, and they're more likely to be playing by these rules than your average player. Right, but even for the normal guy, you know, what's Halliday worth? And in tout, you can bench these guys. I'm thinking of. Trading for Halliday because I like to gamble and I'm a buy low kind of guy. Buy yes, low. And do you think Brian Walton would entertain uh, uh, what's his name? Hinjin uh, Yu or Rue? I, I think it's Yu. But if I he think pitched better, maybe. But he didn't look that great either. I mean, he well, got away with it in terms of the runs allowed, but he was getting giving up a lot of rockets to the Giants and he, no walks though. 
He had like five or six to nine. He was sitting at 89 to 90, though. Uh, What's wrong with fat, that? Didn't run down What's wrong with base? being fat? What's wrong with being <laughs> fat if you're a pitcher? Rick Russell agrees with you, but... Yeah, you know. David Wells was very good, you know? Right. I, I, don't, I don't see a problem with him being fat. But the, but the point is, um, so you wouldn't take it. If you're the holiday owner, you wouldn't take... Uh, Rue or you. I, th- I thought Vince Scully called them Rue, so now I'm a little... I was sure it was you, his yeah, last right. name, R-Y-U, but then when Vince Scully says it, I usually trust him. So um, you wouldn't take Rue for a holiday? Considering I have them both on the same darn team. Uh, I paid five for you, uh, and I played paid 20 for a holiday, so... Okay. No, that's about the who, who That's a quarter on the dollar. Right. Too low for you, huh? Too low. All right. Because I was thinking of making that offer. All right, let's move on from Halliday. I, I'm not convinced that he won't come back, I, but I do think there's a lot of risk and it could be a rocky transition if he doesn't get the velocity back. The one thing that bodes well for him is that he feels fine. He's not injured. His mm-hmm. arm feels great. He can just let it go. He's not, you know. Right. So, 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 so that actually makes me feel a little bit of hope for it. Um, what about um, Tim Lincecum? He got the win. He uh, uh, allowed zero earned runs against the mm-hmm. Dodgers, but he walked seven in five innings. And he's, half of his th- uh, pitches were thrown for strikes, only half. So that, to me, he's the same pitcher. You know, the, the velocity isn't back up yet. You know, he doesn't look confident. You know, he. I think he's – I really think when they, they were the on – The same pitcher as what? Him, you mean his last year? Right. I mean, I think he's just like last year. I, I think he's going to have his outings will do okay. I think the ballpark will mask some of his problems, but – you know, say if someone spent ten dollars on him, I'm not going to trade my fifteen dollar player for him right now. Based on this, that's for sure. I'm not going to play. I pro- and considering I've never been the guy that went ten or eleven or whatever he went for in any league, I'm probably not going to pay ten dollars for him either. So how about this? You have Halliday, uh, the Linsicum owner in labor says, "I'll trade you Linsicum for Halliday." Hmm. You do that deal? Yeah, I would do that. You would take Linsicum over Halliday. I said $0.35 cents on the dollar. Lincecum's $0.50 cents on the dollar there. So, yeah, probably. But Lincecum's diminished, too. You're, you're saying his draft day price is $0.50 cents on the dollar, but, you know, what's he worth now? That's the No, question. because I think that – well, I, put it this way. I had no expectation of Lincecum to begin with. Okay. I had him about where Halliday should be right now. Plus, Lincecum hasn't had the injury as far as we know. Right. He might still be hiding one. He might have been like – it might be his knee where he had problems with uh, planning in the right spot. Maybe that's still in his mind. You know, Bernie Pleskov talked about that last year. He didn't like his plant leg that much. Maybe that's still an issue. Who knows? But I'll say this. The ballpark and the division will mask some of his woes that won't have that – and that Halliday will not have that same advantage. Well, he's going to still play the Marlins a bunch, the Mets. He's going to get the Nationals and Braves. That's the, that's the, that's the downside right, of right. his Right, right. And his ballpark is, you know, Citizens Bank is a much tougher park to pitch than uh, in, out in San Francisco. And he doesn't, get, he doesn't get as much of Petco. He doesn't get much of Dodger Stadium. I would take Halliday over. I would take Halliday over Linskin by a narrow would margin. You? No, yes, I still would. Um, how about Sabathia? Okay, he had a good year last year. He had 197 strikeouts, 44 walks, and 200 innings. Allowed 22 home runs in Yankee Stadium. Same ground ball rate as he had the year before. Velocity was down, but the numbers were perfectly fine, perfectly in line with what he's done. Um, he did spend a little time in the DL. Wound up having a little cleanup procedure where they shaved off a bone spur. Uh, mm-hmm. recovery went without a hitch. There was no setbacks. There was no slowing him down. There was no irritation. Went right through spring training just fine. Gets in his first game, allows seven singles and a double, three walks, strikes out five and five innings. The results weren't pretty. Um, are you lower on Sabathia now than you were heading into the season? I say no because I was a little lower than you to begin with. Um, I think so many people have won fantasy leagues by buying low on CC Sabathia in the past. It's tough to write him off. At the same time, you mentioned his velocity was down last year from his previous years. On opening day, it was down from last year. So if we're looking at velocity as a trigger point, it's there. It's there to be enough to be worried about. Mike Salfino was saying before opening day even that he was he didn't want any shares that he didn't have any shares of Sabathia and it was by design. You know, he's not wrong often about these starting pitchers. He, he's actually had a pretty good track record talking about those these velocity concerns. So. I get it. I, I think you know. I you know. I'm going to buy lower on Sabat, buy low on Sabathia a lot quicker than I am on Halliday or Linscombe. Let's put it that way. But then again, the market's going to be the same way. I'm, he's going to be priced higher regardless of that, that construction. So, uh, I, I look at him more as like eighty cents on the dollar, ninety cents on the dollar sort of guy right now. If I can get that, great. If not, 
then I'll just move on. I'll, I'll be okay with it. I don't think that his owners are willing to sell him that cheaply. Yeah, I, you know, it's really hard to pry players away from people early on. They don't want to – it's hard on both sides. If you're trying to sell Halliday, everyone's like, oh, no, I don't want to touch that, not even for 35 cents on the dollar. And then if you're trying to buy Halliday, they're like, oh, no, no, I, you know, you want him. I, I know he's going to bounce back. So it's like it almost feels mm -hmm. like there's almost no way to make a trade for these guys. You can try. Maybe people are more reasonable and not emotionally attached to the fact they bought them. Um, I'm a little nervous about Sabathia just because of the velocity. But the numbers last year, even with some diminished velocity, were very good. And he's often struggled in April, and he's particularly struggled on opening day. He's just not one of those guys that comes out of the gate quickly. So um, maybe this is just a case of that. Anybody else uh, really moved? You know, Chris Davis hit another home run today. Um, he's <laughs> just absolutely killing the ball. If we were to draft again, you know, I remember saying on the radio, I didn't like Jay Bruce. People were taking the third and fourth round in these 15-team mixed leagues. I said, why is he better than Chris Davis? But I didn't mean that because I love Chris Davis. I meant it like, All right. what's the difference between these two guys? Would you right now? Who would you rather have the rest of the way, Chris Davis or Jay Bruce? Jay Bruce. I'd still because he's going to run about. He's going to get about seven to ten stolen bases. Davis won't get you any of that. That's seven to ten. You mean like four to seven? I'll look at the numbers again, but yeah. I, I, I maybe I'm perceiving him wrong. Maybe that's my red color blinders on me. Who right. knows? Uh, Blinded but, by uh, Jay Bruce's speed, apparently. Yeah, he can play the outfield. Davis can anymore, but I, I think that uh, yeah. I mean, the, Davis has got that job locked up. I, I think he's probably gained a round or two in value. I just uh, that, that start always helps him out. The fact that he came off of such a strong year, his playing time is guaranteed. I think he's probably undervalued going into drafts this year. He might be. I still would rather have Bruce, but it's the gap is narrowed. I'll give you that. I think it's fifty-fifty right now. I don't. I don't see a big difference. I mean, Bruce will draw a few more walks. Um, but uh, but I think the power is equal, and uh, I don't think his, his job was a question anyway. And remember what he did in the minors. He kept getting called up by the Rangers. Yep. His def you know, he was a good defensive player. He had massive power, but he struck out a lot, and he always struggled in his first 50 to 100 bats when he got called mm -hmm. up, and he just kept getting kind of sent down until he finally got traded, and they gave up on him. Uh, and so now they've got Mitch Moreland. Uh, so, you know, this is, this is not that random. This was a guy who really killed the high minors for a while, too. And, so I, you know, I'll say this. He's also hitting off of left-handers. He hit the home run off of Jake, Jake McGee on uh, opening day, and Matt Moore's going today. So that that's actually a pretty good sign, too. That was uh, Roberto Hernandez. Oh, oh it's Hernandez. That's right. It's Matt Moore tomorrow. You're absolutely right. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. I only yeah. Know that Carmona because... screws me again. Yes. But, I, uh, I, I, and uh, I only know that because I have him on my team in labor, so I'm very excited. Did you start him this stuff. week? I did. Well, he was down 2 nothing. I don't want to look now. It's, it was on in the background before. And, uh, and then, uh, you know, I have Miguel Gonzalez also going. So th I have those guys going head-to-head. -head. That could be good, but it could also Just be Just freeze nothing. right there. That's all you want, right? Yeah, 2 nothing's fine. That's a perfect result for me. Right. I'd be very happy with that. Um, any any uh, closing thoughts, and maybe uh, pun intended, uh, yes. about the first week? John Axford. I mean, Captain Obvious here, but... Man, he's in trouble. He was topping. He topped out at 94. He used to top out at 97. When he was getting roped by the Rockies, his first couple batters, he was around 91 to 92 on his fastball. And he's got to have that elite fastball to be effective because this secondary stuff isn't that good. Uh, we talked about this on the air too about who's going to be the who ends up with the most saves for the Brewers. Is it Axford? Is it Henderson? Or is it the field? And I think we both agree it's the field. We just can't identify who in the field is going to be the guy. Mark Rogers, man. Uh, was it, wasn't he a first-round pick, Mark Rogers? I can't remember, but I thought yeah. he was a high pick. Yeah, he was. Yeah. And sometimes those guys with the pedigree, you know, when they can't make it as starters, they want to put them in a prominent role somehow. You know, they've invested in these guys. So I could see it if, if Henderson fails, and, and he may fail, and assuming Axford doesn't get the job back as he did last year. Carlos Marmel, did you catch the save today? It was a Ugliest thing save ever. Thank you, Pedro Alvarez, for giving that free out on three pitches. Right. Oh. And I don't, and I own Alvarez in too many right. places, knowing the risk I'd take. But what a horrible, worthless at bat he had there! I just set the tone for the rest of that inning. Just, just keep the bat on your shoulder for five pitches with him. I mean, is there any reason to swing at the ball? I mean, he's not going to throw three strikes in a row. I mean, I think you can just put your, you know, the bat on your shoulder, and if he doesn't know you're doing that, he's probably going to walk you. And man, the double play. I mean, it was a thing of beauty. I had him on the bench, and you see why now in friends and family. But I have him live in Tout, obviously, in an only league I have him live. Uh, and it was a stiff price to pay for one save. Uh, but I don't know. You know, the Cubs got away with it twice. They, they trotted him out in the first game they were winning. 
and then Fujikawa cleaned it up for him. Uh, and then this game, I mean, they really almost blew a, a sure win. And, I don't, you know, they got away with it. But, you know, they certainly want to rehab him. They want to figure out, you know, get some value out of him. But Who's going to trade for him, though? That no, notion no. is wholly ridiculous. The whole league knows what Carlos Mormol is at this point in time. Yeah, Who's going to give them anything no, about nobody's it? Nobody's going to trade. Forget about that. That ship has sailed. Although, if he saved 10 games in a row and he was smooth, you know, maybe. But that's I don't think that's really... Um, a, a, a likely possibility of getting anything no. significant in trade, but they are paying him six, seven million bucks. He does have a great arm. His velocity was back up last year to ninety three, ninety four on average, and you know it's, they probably do want to get some use out of him if they can. But how many games can they put you know at risk in doing so? Right. Um, and really, he got bailed out in the first game by Garrett Jones swinging at a terrible pitch in the dirt and striking out too. So. Um, Man, he's got one more game, I think, at most, if that. They may not even bring him out next time they have a lead in the ninth inning. If that, he's got one more game. Um, yeah. And otherwise, he's, he, you know, they may release him. I mean, or they'll, they'll put him the option in the monitors if he has options left, but otherwise they could release him. Yeah, and, you know, I thought it was really hilarious. I was watching the Cubs side of the broadcast, and the second batter he walked, it was back-to-back -back sliders out of the zone, kind of close, but he goes, man, how do you like the Cubs announcer goes, man, how do you lay off those pitches? I'm like, it's Carlos Marmol. Of course he laid off of them. Right. Well, what else are you supposed to do? How can you lay off that pitch? I mean, first of all, he used to be unhittable when you did swing, so there's really right. just no point in swinging whatsoever. The only point in swinging is just so he knows that you're not bluffing so that he doesn't just, like, throw a straight ball at 80 miles an hour to right. get the strike. Let him try to throw his crazy slider uh, and make him think that you might swing at it, but just never actually swing at it. That's, the, that's how you beat Marmol. Just don't swing, ever. Right. So uh, any other any other closers? The Detroit situation seems to be a mess. Nobody really believed Phil Coke was going to be the closer. I mean, did, did anyone really think Phil Coke was going to be the closer? That seemed far fetched to me. Uh, I thought Dotel was. He was used in the sixth inning today. Uh, I don't. You know, they got blown up, so we didn't really see the late innings. What would happen? Villarreal, mm -hmm. I think, got blown up today. Um, they signed Jose Valverde to a minor league deal. Why not a major league deal? I mean, if he, you know, if he's really going to be the closer, do they, well, because he's not up to speed. They can't. They don't want him to work. Get up to speed on in, in big league games. He's going to need a month. They said if he's not in the big league roster in a month, then he can opt out or whatever. That's enough time. This is his spring training, basically. That's the way I look at it. So I, 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 I that's and the price is right now. They're not committed to anything. That's fine. Uh, I'm still on Team Albuquerque, but you know he has to be worked uh, in the ninth inning too before we actually put him on that. It looks like Ben Waugh is probably the guy to own right now. Would be my guess. He's pitched well two days in a row, two games in a row in the eighth inning, and got one out in the ninth in the first in opening day against the Twins. Then they had that slew of lefties come up. The real mistake for me was Jim Leland used to Phil Cook against righties, thinking that he's a multi-use uh, pitcher. No, he's a lefty specialist. Just keep him in that role. Right. That's what was odd about it. Um, the other thing is there were reports that Valverde was throwing 95 and had lost 20 pounds, but uh, I'm not sure those didn't come from his agent. You know what I mean? Yeah, he, right. Like that. Which is Scott Horace, by the way. Yeah, right. I mean, oh, yeah, a big binder, and it, they read it. Oh, well. Right. He's just he's bummed out about the Cano signing with Jay Z, so he's trying to <laughs> he's trying to compensate with Valverde. That's his that's his play.